Sangwa. My name is Washington Kapapiro. I'm uh, the chairman for the Association for African Owned Enterprises. Uh, we're the leading organization who represent professional and entrepreneurial Africans in the UK. My name is Rolo Mazendi. I'm, I'm a nurse. I'm a community district sister in Wales. Um, just to make it short, that's the way. Uh, I'm Reverend Zembi, I'm based in Wales, uh, actually I did social sciences and I'm running a small business, important export, uh, cleaning businesses and uh, actually doing pastoral work in Wales. Uh, my name is Patrick Sibarashi and I'm uh, uh, the head of Zim Online Radio, uh, basically Zim Online Media, which is a radio station and online newspaper and also social portal. Uh, my name is Barbara Nyagomo. Uh, my first profession Nya, Nya. Nyagomo. Nyagomo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Manyiruke is uh, chair of the political science department at USED, uh, Dr. Charity Manyiruke. I last passed through London in 1986. Is a long time ago. Some of you may not have been there. <laughs> and uh, this time around, I'm here, I'm the first Zambian minister to be invited to the UK by the British government for some political discussion. Uh, we came here uh, in, um, as a committee, as members of the committee, on the re engagement. After the inclusive government was formed, and both of us now realize that the sanctions were hitting our people, there was no equality voice over that issue. Uh, a a, a re-engagement committee comprising myself, Mr. Mangoma from MDCT, and Mrs. Ms. Ayrabi from MDC, uh, was put together to lobby for the lifting of sanctions. Uh, we have had previous visits to three visits to Brussels, but uh, nothing has been coming. So when we visited Brussels last year, we made it clear that uh, uh, clearly the way we saw it, the ball was in their court. And when they are ready, they will tell us, but otherwise we will not waste our time to visit them. And uh, we have always maintained, as you know, that uh, the issue, the problems around Zimbabwe were a bilateral problem between the British and Zimbabwe, and revolving around the resolution of the land question, which is the last outstanding issue, a, a colonial issue to be resolved. It's a decolonizing issue, and its satisfactory resolution will make us a, a truly free the country. So anyway, they invited us uh, and uh, we arrived on Monday and um, uh, maybe just to, for those of you who may not know the background, it's important I think to understand why we have this rift between us and Zimbabwe, between the UK and, the, and Zimbabwe. Uh, some of you be aware our whole struggle was <coughs> around the land question. Uh, that is why people uh, decided to pay the ultimate price. Uh, it was basically to regain pos reposition of our, of our land. In 1979, when the uh, Langas House Conference was held, uh, we were persuaded uh, that uh, resources would be made available, there were commitments that resources would be made available primarily by the British but also assisted by the American allies. Resources were to be made available to, to government to pay for compensation to white farmers. All was well with the Thatcher administration and also with the joint major administration. We were at talking terms. Uh, with the major administration, we actually negotiated a, 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 a land reform program 
where the British were to provide the resources for us to acquire 5 million hectares of land. As you know, at independence, even uh, 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 up to 1990, uh, 4,000 white farmers and something like 15 million hectares of land. So we had negotiated with the major government to acquire 5 million of that. Unfortunately for John Major, and unfortunately for us, unfortunately for the destiny of our country, for the revolution, John Major lost in the 1997 elections, and John and Blair came in. When he came in, uh, we raised the issue about compensation, about the agreement we had reached with John Major, and basically reminding him that he was a success administration to, to, the, to John Major. Uh, he refused to talk to us. He also refused to talk to our president completely. Uh, and as a result, uh, and before he knew what was happening, he started putting out accusations that uh, we had problems about human rights and that we were violators of human rights. That was a lie to the British people, primarily to hide away from the fact that the dispute between us was the land issue. I don't know. The, in fact, the, the dispute between us was a land issue. And in fact, what he says does, what anger does, was that Blair started lying, that, well, started telling us or telling whoever cared to listen. Why would Mugabe want to chase away from farmland uh, white farmers who are productive, who have the skills, who are more productive than black people? Why should they not keep the land in those hands so that the white people can continue producing for them? Uh, as you can appreciate, given our revolutionary history, that was clearly raising a, a red flag in our face. Uh, we could notice a black government uh, run a country on the premise that black uh, can't do that, can't do this, can't produce, can't, no, we, we don't do it that way. So we took a, st a stand that uh, we should fulfill the major issue, about the core issue, which was the, uh, the underlying cause in our liberation struggle. So I'm just sketching out so that you understand the dispute. So when Blair took the position that uh, he must put a stop to the land equation, uh, to the redistribution, he put out those lies about us. Uh, but he went further. He, the, he persuaded other political parties represented in the House of Commons to put up a fund, the West Minister Foundation, to fund the uh, the the, the start of an opposition party, the MDC. That's how they did it. And it's public. These are figures and statements in the public domain. Uh, I, I, and, and primarily it was to stop us from redistributing the land, from fulfilling one of the key issues in our liberation struggle. So the struggle then started, and I think some of it are aware uh, what has been happening. Sanctions were imposed, uh, and sanctions hate our people. They basically, they they uh, hate our economy. The social infrastructure is run down. I'm talking about education, health is run down. Uh, the road infrastructure, Zimbabwe has now almost uh, uh, they now a, a reputation for potholed highways. Uh, uh, everything got run down. Uh, generation capacity, we couldn't access soft loans from the world, well, although we are a member. We couldn't have balance of payment support from IMA, although we are a member. And what is worse, at the time that we this quarrel was picked up by the British, uh, we the industry and commerce the, was dominated by British companies, who then taking the coup from their uh, uh, government, that is the British government, downgraded their operations, some even closed, uh, some downsized, some closed completely and went to other 
to other places. So this at a time when we had no meaningful economic link with any other country outside South Africa, the Europe and the British. It, in 2000, we had no economic link whatsoever with certifiers, none. So as a result now of the challenges that we were facing, we then adopted the Lucas policy in order to continue fighting while basically uh, living on a care and uh, maintenance uh, basis. So uh, essentially, that's what has been happening in these past years. And I was telling uh, Chihuahua and uh, Zambis that uh, if it had come in 2008, we were at our worst moments. We were at our worst moments. Uh, but uh, given our liberation history, uh, they were not able to, to bear us in 2008. That had been the intention to wipe us out completely because the kind of which imposed sanctions, not only imposed sanctions, but they banked on a regime change agenda. And sanctions were basically uh, about effecting a regime change agenda, meaning uh, eliminating ZANU PF as a key political player uh, from the landscape, political landscape of Zimbabwe. So they mounted that onslaught and they failed in 2008. Uh, and uh, which basically uh, bears uh, testimony to the strength of our liberation experience. If we did not have that resilience as we had accumulated and acquired during the liberation struggle, we could have been completely off the scene uh, in 2008. But another aspect of the, of the sanctions which uh, uh, which uh, basically was more evil, was basically to deny ZANU PF a voice in those countries which impose sanctions. Through the media, we were not allowed. Anything that we did was not reported. It's like a non-event. If we were involved in a fight with, say, inter-party, uh, we are attacked, we are attacked back, uh, and so on, only the attack by ZANU PF would be reported. The, 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 in other words, we had we to defend ourselves. And when we were defending ourselves, that is what was re, uh, uh, reported in the media is assault on MDC and uh, as if, again portraying, as if there was no provocation. So, uh, and when we explained, again, nothing was explained, nothing was published. So that is, that is the environment which has been, which catalyzed our British-Zimbabwe relationship from almost 1997. It has not been easy. It has not been easy for us. But fortunately for us, uh, you know, because they failed to, to, to fail us in 2008, uh, time is a great healer. And our people now see what we were talking about, especially they now see our vision, we now share our vision. Our vision primarily is that colonialism left us with nothing and even come to 2000 or so, black people had nothing and um, there is clearly we, we will be stupid to be ministers of government, to have soldiers, police, defending an economy in which we had no stake. So our message now, and this is the message that our people has resonated with our people, is that we need to, to increase the involvement and participation of Zimbabweans in our economy, both in terms of ownership of assets and also in terms of management of those assets. It should be just not management, but also ownership. We need to, blacks to be key players in their own country. And already that is beginning to take root in Zimbabwe. We are now finding Zimbabweans in sectors that were almost undreamt of 14 years ago, which is a very positive sign and a very positive, uh, uh, in a very positive uh, di di direction. 
So what I think you need to know about indigenization economic empowerment is that we want blacks to be in control of their resources, to be in charge of their resources in every sense. We want the economy to be Zimbabwean, not just in the name, but in the sense that Zimbabweans have a stake, they, are, they, they, are, they, they have 90% or 80% ownership and 100% management of that economy. We want it to be a British, in the same way that British economies, the key players in this economy are British. In the same way that in Germany, the key players are German. So while we appreciate that we are starting from zero, and we appreciate that it's a process, but we have already started that journey. That first step, we have taken it. And which means that, and this is my view, my vision of the future, if we should look at each sector, study it, understand it, and understand why, to what extent it's already owned and managed by Zimbabweans, and if not what the causes are, and if adopt strategies that basically address those shortcomings. If it is skills, then we, 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 we look for them, where to find them. If it is foreign capital, then we try to see whether we can woo foreign capital to match our own resources and to match the human capital that fortunately for Zimbabwe we, we, we have been able to build over, uh, over the years since independence. So basically that is, uh, so when they invited us on, we came here on Monday, <coughs> there was a reception on Monday evening and uh, it, uh, it was hosted by Minister for Africa, uh, Mark Simmons, and he spoke, basically, I, he, this was repeated even in the private meeting that we held with him the following day on Tuesday. Basically his message is, uh, they want to re-engage Zimbabwe bilaterally. They recognize and acknowledge that the problem is bilateral and that one of the issues, key issues to be discussed uh, in that bilateral discussion, if any, is the land question. Uh, they also said that uh, they want, they are not on to stop to, to do a, 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 a to effect a regime change agenda. That's what they say. Uh, but like he, so my response was over engagement. We never disengaged from the British. It was they who disengaged from us. And that when they are seriously ready to engage us, they know where to find us. Because this rift was since 1997. It's not us who caused this blare. So if and when they decide to seriously take that extra step to engage us bilaterally, they will know where to find us. Only the, the uh, statement that they uh, will not continue with the regime change agenda, I said time will tell. But uh, uh, we will remain cautious, even as we talk to them, we remain cautious, we will remain vigilant. And we will, like the proverb, proverb okay, sleep with one eye open. So that basically is my response on the uh, issue about uh, uh, regime change agenda. On the question of, um, of sanctions, we said there can be no full normalization of relations until all sanctions are removed. Uh, and the fa facade or the charade that you experience where they say we have lifted sanctions, in fact, suspended sanctions, which is not lifting, by the way. It's suspending. Suspending something is not the same thing as lifting. Suspending means you remain suspended. Yes, it's there. Whereas lifting, you are basically removing and putting it somewhere else. So we understand that semantics. So we have said uh, uh, until sanctions are lifted, we will not have any meaning. There will be no normalization of relations. 
So that is where, with respect to re-engagement, that is where basically we are. Uh, uh, I don't know. The next step is going to be their step. Uh, as far as I can see, I don't foresee anything before the elections. Uh, we also said to them, because I saw, I picked up that they, they are very keen to come and observe our elections. So I made it very clear that we will not invite them, because the issue about elections being observed is basically in the entire discretion of the country whose elections are to be observed. And we said that we are not going to invite those representatives from countries which have imposed sanctions against Zimbabwe. So that they, we gave them that, that message. For, for you who are in the diaspora, uh, uh, it's important to understand that you will not have a vote. And the reason basically is that for the past 14 or so years, uh, you have been captive voters. I don't mean you only, but some of you have made your rigor to withstand it, but not everyone. He had been captive audience to a British viewpoint, MDC viewpoint, and none for Zanopia. And generally, if we are seeking votes from an electorate, from a people, all of us must be accessible. That you should not be only accessible to only to one group. All of us should be accessible to, to that uh, constituency. We seek to uh, people to vote for us. Uh, and in this case, it's not been accessible to us. This is the first time that perhaps we are meeting as NPF minister in, the, in as many years, in 14 and a half years. But even then, I come here under the, you know, to come here, it's in the discretion again of the British government. Now, we can't have a constituency where you can't come and go as and when you want. The fact that there is not that freedom of movement means that uh, uh, you are not accessible also. Even if there were other considerations which were favorable uh, for, for you, even if we were all coming, the fact that my coming is dependent on the discretion of the British government, it's like they are doing me a favor, and again, because the, the regime change agenda, they will not exercise that discretion <coughs> in our favor. So I want you to understand that. But those of you who have resources can come and register and come and vote. There is no problem uh, about, about, about that. Uh, then the other issues, uh, the other issues, I think I've touched on the sanctions. Uh, there is another issue which keeps cropping up. When are the elections going to take place? And so on. Our election, our referendum went very well. Uh, our referendum, despite the, the usual detractors, they, they went exceedingly well. And one thing that makes me proud is Zimbabwe is that whatever challenges that we have confronted or we have faced over the past 14 or so years, uh, all those challenges have been resolved through dialogue among Zimbabweans without an impost, impost solution, without interference from anyone. That makes me proud because it gives us, it, it means that we have the capacity to resolve and to, to address our, our, our challenges. Uh, we started a dialogue with them, with MDC, and I was representing Zambia from 2000. They were off, off, on, and off, on. I, I was then uh, discussing with Professor Nube when they were still a United MDC. And we went very far to the extent between the two of us, we produced the Kariba draft. Uh, then uh, later on, the respective parties recognized the work we were doing and gave us, each was then represented. When they split up, then we became a threesome. And each, each of us was represented by two negotiators. Uh, uh, Komri Goshedai representing ZANU-PF 
Mube at that time had Mr. representing MGC, M at that time, and BT and Mangoma representing MGCT. So that's how we have been. So subsequently, we went to do a lot of changes to the constitution, constitution number 17, although they reneged it the last time, uh, the last moment, to do with irreversibility of land. But uh, fortunately, ZANPF had a majority in the House. We passed it without them. But <coughs> it's something that we negotiated in the agreement. Because the problem is that uh, with the MTC uh, people, if we, if we talk to ourselves as Zimbabweans, we quickly agree because we all know the reality of our situation. It's when they then go to consult their white friends that they come to want to change the goalposts and so forth. They're clearly indicating that their interests are not the same interests as those people who are financing them or who are advising them. Uh, but anyway, the long and short of it is that we were able to agree and sign the global political agreement. Uh, every word there was drafted by us without anyone interfering in the wedding, where to put the coma, where to put the uh, Similarly, we agreed that we go to, uh, to a review of the constitution that we tried to do <coughs> from the Langa South Conference. We succeeded, went to the people, and succeeded to produce a draft, which we put to a referendum, and basically the referendum has been able to, to adopt it. Now, the stages that are going to follow uh, after the 16th are that uh, the bill, a constitutional amendment bill was gazetted actually on Thursday. I was away, but I knew it was going to be gazetted on Thursday. And we introduced it in Parliament only after 30 days uh, computed from Thursday. So we start counting Friday onwards. Uh, then only after 30 days can you, you uh, in terms of the constitutional requirement. Then after that, we, it's ascended to, if it passes through the House, and I don't see any difficulties in passing it through the House, after that it will be ascended to. After then we begin amendments to the electoral law to align the electoral law to the new constitution. As you know, the new constitution allows for a women's quota. Uh, we agreed that we should uh, make efforts to increase women participation and involvement in, in decision-making institutions. And we are starting with the Parliament, both House of Assembly and Senate. For instance, I'll give you just to show you how thinly represented they are. In, uh, currently, they are probably something like what? Um, uh, roughly, say, 310, some, something like that. Of that 310, we are lucky to have 25 women. So it's a men's world, a men dominated world. And we are trying to abide by AU and SADAC uh, conventions which require that we should start a process to enhance their participation in decision making up to say 50%. Uh, although they are 52%, if we can get somewhere there, it will be very good. Uh, in local government, their participation is actually great. I was being given the, the figures by Comrade Muchigure. I was quite um, uh, surprised. We have 1,900 uh, 1,980 or something like that wards countrywide. Mm -hmm. uh, of those councillors, which means we should have uh, barring deaths and so on, we should have 1,980 or thereabouts councillors. Of that, women are about 900, which already is a very good uh, uh, start. It's a good start. So the problem is with parliament and the, and the Senate. So we, are, we have that women's court. Now, when we are made the, the electoral law, we have to take into account that. Uh, we also have to take into account the fact that the uh, Senate, we have uh, done away with senatorial constituencies and introduced proportional representation. We have also 
uh, uh, introduced a new organ in the provinces called Provincial Council. So Chigwagwa was in local government, you know. We used to have Provincial Council, but it was basically of civil servants. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. Yeah, 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 but yeah. this time it will be made up ex officio of all those members of parliament, both to the Senate and the House, who come from that province. They will be ex officio members, plus 10 who are going to be elected through proportional representation. The election to the Senate through proportional representation is on the basis of a party list system, six per province. So each party will put up a party list of six people. And those six people uh, will, should I say, uh, will be uh, uh, follow, will follow a zebra party, uh, starting with a woman at the top. So it will be a woman, a man, a woman, a man, a woman, a man on that list. Uh, and because it's starting with the women, it means <coughs> it will be favoring uh, women's getting into parliament. Because the first round from all the parties will throw up uh, uh, women. Yeah. It will throw up women wherever you're looking at. It will throw up women. So that is uh, uh, something that we are very proud about. So after that is done, uh, after those amendments, then we start the electoral process. Uh, then there will be a proclamation by the president nomination day and uh, election date. Uh, what I think you need to know is that the life of our parliament ends on the 29th of June. Uh, which means that if, uh, uh, but the constitution allows us to have elections after 29th of June. But we'll then be governing without a parliament. Something that uh, uh, we should try to avoid because it could create a vacuum which could precipitate a crisis and we should try to avoid that. Uh, we have been refused and denied a voice uh, in, in the British political landscape. In, in, in fact, in all the countries that have imposed sanctions, not only because of the travel bans, but also just the reporting. Uh, it has been so skewed, so biased, full of distortions, misinformation, disinformation, lies. That uh, clearly when I read about myself, I can't recognize myself. Because I know what I do. <laughs> when I, say, I can't recognize myself. <laughs> neither, neither, neither my wife. They lie about what we've said. They lie about what we've done. And it's almost futile to, to, to come down to it because the whole thing is so coordinated and so rampant that you can't get a voice saying BBC, uh, Al Jazeera, they just shut us out. So as a result, we appear like we are monsters when in fact we are just uh, ordinary human beings mm. to a point that those, some of us, especially in the UK, uh, have been made to believe the lies. And so their picture of me, of my colleagues, is basically those lies. And when sometimes we've had the privilege of meeting, they can't also believe it's me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to basically shout and say, please touch me, it's me. This is me, you know, because their picture about me is also a very distorted picture. You know, it's a picture of one who has been put out as a murderer, as every evil that you can think of, they put out uh, against me. But because it was very clear that we are fighting a just cause, what you always need in any fight is a cause. In our case, it has been a privilege for us to fight a good fight, a good cause. A fight which basically means that we are laying a foundation for future generations so that they know that Zimbabwe is their country and there is no other one. They can be treated like rubbish anywhere else, but they should know that when they come to Zimbabwe, 
the sky is the limit in terms of opportunities. Just that notion that the sky is the limit is the limit is a very good notion. Whereas in the environment you are operating, uh, you know, it's uh, there is an invisible ceiling. And so invisible that you could end up not believing in yourself because you don't see it. You then think it's because of your inability or incapacity, when in fact it's not. Because either you are looked into as a black person or as a foreigner, whichever way you know the black person is at the bottom of the social path. You can't dream of owning a bank insurance company and so on. But when I talk, you, the sky is the limit. In fact, I tell people the wealthy Zimbabweans now are not my age group. They are your age group. Probably his age group. He looks here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 35 below, 48 below. Those are the people who have made money. Those are the people who own your, I mean, everything. In fact, it's like, if you refer to farmers, it's like the green fingers. It's like what they touch tends to gold and money. But it, personally, I understand it because you have more skills than we have. You have been exposed better than we have. So you see opportunities where we don't see them. We were, our whole education was completely different. Probably more towards academic than uh, earning a living because we were all made to train to say you must look for employment mm -hmm. to a white man and keep the job. And keep the job. Please and behave. Okay, don't get fired. <laughs> don't get fired. Behave and keep the job. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So we were trained to be an employee. Now we hope to train a generation which believe they can be employers. Mm -hmm. And already those of you who come home, I've seen a lot of that. It's on a small scale. But a lot of people now ask, are employers in their own right. They may employ five people, ten people, but they're employers. Something that in fact was unheard of and unthinkable, except if you were a, a shop owner at Machibis. You know? So the, 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 the opportunities have now expanded. And, and I, I mean what I said. Now, the other thing I want you to understand is uh, you will hear, and I'm sure as we go towards the election, there will be allegations flying all over. Zanu PF is a violent party. Uh, Zanu PF is a violent party. The truth of the matter is that we, as Zimbabweans, we have a culture of violence. And there has been intra violence, intra party within our respective parties, within their MDC uh, formations, intra, especially when we come and go towards primary elections. Uh, but there is also inter-party, where supporters of MDC will provoke and throw stones at supporters of ZANU if the fight <laughs> begins, and there is a fight and it's important. Now, the Unfortunate thing has been when the inter-party violence is reported, only ZANPF is reported as the culprit. When in fact it's a shared culpability, shared responsibility. So when we started negotiating the uh, global political agreement, the first thing we discussed was what to do with who caused the political violence of 2008. And we all agreed that our supporters were all to blame. And we made a joint press statement, basically saying we are all to blame. So the responsibility to deal with political violence is basically a collective responsibility. So as we go towards the elections, it is something that we have to work hard collectively to ensure that we keep rain on our supporters, that they don't get overly excited. That is very so you need to know is both sides. Our president has been speaking endlessly about keeping the peace 
and that we don't want any violence, we don't want the forthcoming elections to be marred by violence. That we have been mentioning. So I'm hopeful uh, the referendum went well, but the referendum is different from election because there is no contestation. In particular with this one, once the political parties had agreed uh, that there would be no, uh, we were agreed on the draft, it meant that would go uh, basically uh, as one, and there was no basis on which uh, people could start getting at each other's throat. The issue that, in fact, I raised with the, with the so-called Friends of Zimbabwe, with, with whom we had a meeting on Tuesday, is that uh, they should stop the regime change agenda which they've been perpetrating through NGOs. Uh, some of you may not be aware, we have over 3,000 NGOs in Zimbabwe. Small as we are, we have more than 3,000 NGOs. And those NGOs, they have nothing to show for it. They are one man, one woman, briefcase NGOs. Basically, carrying out an agenda to destabilize, to provoke, to put out and send to the uh, capitals of foreign capitals lies upon lies upon lies. That is the tragedy of our country right now. So, especially those of you who are on the internet, you see the internet awash with nothing just but lies, lies, lies. If you were to uh, make an opinion or to take a decision on the basis of, uh, of what you read on the internet, uh, or what you read in the place, foreign press, uh, you get off the you get it off the ground. In Zimbabwe at the moment, as you know, we opened up space. There are a lot of now uh, private uh, newspapers. Uh, we now have two radio stations, as you know, Star FM and ZFM. Uh, I think there will be many more probably opening up uh, like you say, community radio stations. So the space has been opened up uh, uh, greatly. Uh, and um, you need to know also that um, there are three pilot radio stations which broadcast, dedicated to Zimbabwe, broadcasting into Zimbabwe in airspace, demonizing ZANU-PF, demonizing President Mugabe, demonizing anything that is ZANU-PF and so on. That is shortwave. Shortwave Radio Africa is beamed from here. Uh, Studio 7 beamed from Washington. <laughs> Voice of the People beamed from the Netherlands. Dedicated to demonizing Zanu uh, uh, and so on. Uh, um, so you have those networks beaming into, into our uh, airspace. This is to complement the sanctions, the NGOs in effecting the change. change. Mm. So I, I, I say, like I said earlier, we are very strong to have withstood the onslaught that was unleashed against us in 2008. Uh, if we had not gone, if we had not had the liberation history and the resilience, we would have been swept off the board, clearly because the pressure was intense. Uh, so the, we have told them that you know, these NGOs must stop uh, provoking us, because what they do, they, commit, they are committing crimes, because without committing crimes, they will not achieve their regime change agenda. But when they get arrested, they shout. And when they shout, obviously, those who send them are the first to make the most noise. Shona Inoti, Ba Shona Inoti, you know, Kana Uchida, and this woman is going to go now, Muriya Kala, this thing has been made by the UP. Ukabata Muriya Jo, my watch has been bad. Anu Vau, you know, for what you say, you will be my watch. You understand? And that is basically what is happening with these NGOs. You touch any one of them, 
you find the noise reverberates in the Western world to our Italy because we are basically touching where it's hitting them. You see. Uh, so so you need to know what Kunema NGOs. And some of these challenges you need to understand what no, uh, this is not any way to conduct you. Personally, I just need to end here on the end. I see the end here on the end. Do you understand? So sometimes you, 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 you blame us for no basis. It's a little bit of 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 a little tried to come out to be our voice here, have been wounded, almost wounded. And I'm super like you, you know, have been wounded. And as a result, of course, uh, we understand the situation, the environment you are living in. So sometimes I, I didn't know that will come from that far to come and beat us, quite honestly. I, I feel flattered and uh, very impressed. The, that commitment in it, would, Move the The fact that the thought that is, uh, you you had to to come and visit me, uh, I I feel very impressed, and I will report it when I go back. I will report it with uh, her. Uh, there is there are some cadres. Uh, there may have been some break in terms of communication between us and them, but uh, we have people who are quite dedicated uh, to to to. The course. <coughs> uh, we, as you know, we SADA has been facilitating, has played a facilitating role in all our problems. But what I notice, of course, is that uh, the Western countries would want SADA to impose a solution. So we made it clear that the role of a facilitator is to facilitate and not to impose. Facilitation means that. If we are, we put all our concerns on the table, we are discussing, and if somehow we find we don't, we are not able to find each other for some reason. You can call from my now side and say, here is our problem, how do you see it? You understand? And then they can find ways of facilitating so that we can reach a common ground. But you can't say everything. It's almost like, you know, it's not different from the family. If every day you, you are finding someone from outside to cancel you in your marriage, it's very clear the marriage is failed. Fail. You know, every step, you know, in the morning, you want someone to come in. The, you, in the afternoon, in the evening, I shall go back to work in a bedroom. You understand? So, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So it has to be. So we have to watch that, and I think we 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 are very conscious uh, to to do that. Uh, I think I've already uh, discussed about uh, indigenization. I think we all understand that. Uh, um, there have been. Uh, Statements about um, about arrest, selective arrest, and so on, and we deny that because people have been put up to do to effect regime change. To effect the regime change, you need to do criminal things, and because they are criminal things, sometimes you get away because you no, know, they don't come to the notice of the police. But sometimes. Uh, and then you are caught by the police. And the police have you to do what they are there for. They arrest you and they charge, and it's up to the ghost to decide whether the police or the accused is telling the truth. So that is another aspect that you find we come under quite some heavy criticism. So, anyway, I thought that. Uh, uh, that completes my brief. Yes, I, I think uh, since after the meeting, we then had a meeting with Chatham House. Uh, but basically, we more or less went through the same round uh, as we did when we had a meeting with the French in Zimbabwe. Uh, 
in the meeting of the friends of Zimbabwe, I, I, I said, I don't think you are our friends, because <laughs> friends don't impose sanctions against each other. Mm -hmm. And besides, our experience is that they were the so-called friends of Libya, <laughs> when you want to speed the bombing of Libya. Yeah. Yeah. And right now, they are so-called friends of Syria, who are arming the Syrian rebels. So, we must remain cautious and vigilant. Mm. Yeah, we must remain cautious and vigilant. I think that he, if I, I finished my piece. Ah. Yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, for such a uh, well uh, thought out research position. Uh, which I think goes a long way uh, in our history as uh, putting up a cornerstone in guiding uh, our own sovereignty. And I think uh, we'll just put it across the house that people can maybe ask one or two questions uh, to have an insight into some of the discussion areas. Um. I have uh, a few other questions. Yeah, sure. Some of them they just are suggesting. I, I hope that at the end of the day you will make me a list uh, uh, of your names, telephone number, and email. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, well, uh, we want, uh, before you go back, we will have you have a copy of the recording as well. Ah, that, that's even better. Yeah. Ah, that's even better. Yeah. I'm also yeah. scared of <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to um, ask, uh, well, ask maybe a question, then another one later. So that I'll give it from yeah, yeah, please. some of them from my uh, from my experience as a media practitioner. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, um, the first one that I have is more of a uh, a question as well as a suggestion. Mm. The world is evolved technologically. Yeah. We are now into the uh, fiber optics era mm. where everything is now electronic. Mm. And mm. And I was hurt when I heard you say how much we, how much um, the nationalistic gap, the part of government was being blocked out, but the Zambi outside the government mm. uh, blacked out. Mm. Systematically, systematically. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and strategically. And um, uh, we, as the younger generation, and also in view of also because I have an 11 year old son mm. and a five year old son. Mm. So I look at that, I look in retrospect, this is also the future of the colleges, exactly. Um, to, I feel we are also not playing so much a part to in the end and also to play a part in that uh, network. Now, you mentioned three uh, internet-based radio stations which have been in Zimbabwe and which do one in uh, uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, why don't we also, not as a counter, but as also take advantage of the resources, the expertise, and the capable Zimbabweans that are passionate about, about Zimbabwe as well. And, uh, and also, do <coughs> some translations. My in the northern cities, it's all it takes for you to prevail, is that the right to remain silent. Mm -hmm. So, if we have uh, the good policies, we have it all, uh, why don't you take advantage of that, that systematic, uh, of that digital era as well, and, <coughs> and play a part? Mm -hmm. um, that, that will be the first part of it. And that also enhance engagement. Um, engagement doesn't, we cannot, I know we do have restriction that um, you are, like you said, becomes yeah. at their discretion. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, internet can be. Internet can be, yeah. Like mm -hmm. I say that uh, three times a day, Honorable Kasukwe on the radio, and he was uh, talking to the world life mm -hmm. in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And when uh, uh, Professor Mkambala came here, the Deputy Prime Minister, mm -hmm. for the, was it four hours, was it? Yeah. It was life, mm -hmm. life to the whole world. Mm -hmm. So we slowly, when we started, it was quite a challenge. I must be honest with you. I'm sure Chukwabo uh, can actually tell you how much I was told he must be deported. Uh, he is 
a major role in all those kind of things. But resiliently, I was trained out of resilience. Mm -hmm. We stayed. And we are gaining pro uh, prominence on the social network of the group that is 64,000 Zimbabweans who are pro Zimbabwean, pro active. And uh, mm -hmm. if we are going to have where we have uh, engagement with the Minister of Justice, mm -hmm. with the Minister of Water Resources, the Minister of regular interaction with those kind of things, mm -hmm. I feel at the end of the day, it might not match, it might not be so much, but it will, be, it, it will at least give people somewhere where they can easily get at least our voice heard mm -hmm. and our unbiased and our un, 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 undiluted uh, voice heard. Mm -hmm. That will be my first part. Mm -hmm. can, can I just say something in support of that? Um, and, and so I think one of the things that we've seen as uh, an, an organization who looks at um, Africans as a community in the UK. We found that a lot of uh, uh, governments and other ministers who've tried to engage with communities, it seems as though they've struggled to identify really effective uh, media houses and uh, platforms to engage with. Um, is that something that you, you've experienced yourselves? I mean, I know there's been 14 and a half years when you haven't been able to identify the Zim Online radios um, uh, well, this is my first uh, meeting, uh, uh, basically, uh, to do with Zim Online. Oh, since I came, it has been one BBC interview after another. Mm. Uh, Focus on Africa, <coughs> News Day, uh, Ad Talk, and uh, World Service, BBC World Service. Uh, I've not had an opportunity to engage the media here outside that. Uh, outside that. Tomorrow, before I leave, I'm, I'll, I'm going to to appear or to, to talk on a community radio station. <coughs> uh, something has been organized for me by Zimbabweans. Mm. Uh, and they say that it is quite a wide reach, uh, that uh, community radio station. And uh, they, I was Outside that, you now. Uh, a big home, you know, because I'm not into publicity. Uh, I, I, I don't want to mislead you. I have no, no contact with, say, the internet, the same online, and so on. Apart from just reading the internet, also like everybody else. But in terms of uh, uh, propagating my views or positions through the internet now. But again, it's uh, like I was saying, uh, you must understand the, how do I call it, the generational uh, gap <coughs> that exists between my generation and you people. Uh, the challenge is basically to close that gap in the sense that uh, you should be able to uh, to advise us what to do, uh, and that uh, uh, we give you the space to do it, and then we see what happens. Mm. Because often people say no to because they don't know what you are talking about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So you need to find a way which basically to communicate to the leadership your ideas so that they can take it on board. Mm -hmm. Once they warm up to it, and generally it's always better, I'm sure you agree, you, it has to be someone, you know, when you want to bring about change, uh, if you start it in a vacuum, it won't, you won't go very far. So you must study the, uh, the, uh, the elements involved and then say, how do I bring about this change? You start talking maybe to one person you think occupies a critical position. Maybe he also knows you even better. So that there is that element of trust. And once that element of trust is built up and you sell a good idea, they give you the space. Because at the end of the day, you are, uh, when you start things, you make some mistakes. You need someone who will be able to protect you and to protect the project so that it remains on course. 
Because some of these things may not be overnight thing, but you need it over time. And once people get to know, get to know, then you find it takes off. So the point I'm making is that we are available for advice. But if you are looking for those initiatives to come from us, then maybe your expectations are misplaced. Because we are not as exposed <coughs> as well. So sometimes you take for granted a lot. You understand? All I do on my computer is basically email and going into the internet only for something in reading newspapers. That's all. Anything outside that, <laughs> she was basically showing me uh, a lot of things she's doing on the, on the iPad. Uh, apparently, most of our meetings she was recording, and she was now playing back, and she was even saying, uh, this can be given to ZBC. Say the interviews that I conducted, the meeting that I, I conducted, which she recorded. Now, all that I wouldn't know until she told me. So, don't take for granted. That's my answer. But we are ready to be advised. Available to be advised. Just for giving us this chance. Um, as a Zimbabwean, I've always desired to, to take back the skills, uh, the knowledge that I've gained yeah. since I came to this country, mm. especially in the Ministry of Health, because that's where my specialty is. Mm. My question or my suggestion, is there a question or suggestion, is there any opportunity for skilled Zimbabweans who are in the diaspora to, to join up together or would we have a, an opportunity or a chance to do it, to join up together with our skills, the occupational therapists, the doctors, the nurses, the physiotherapists, to join up together and do something significant for the health system of Zimbabwe, including the pharmacists as well. Is there any chance for us to come to Zimbabwe and say, here we are, we've got the skills, we need to do something within the health, the Ministry of Health? You, you know, to do that, you must first be organized. You must be organized. Uh, you are basically talking about people from those various disciplines who are working here in the UK. Mm -hmm. Now, to get to a point where you say we are now organized as medical fraternity, it's a big challenge, both in terms of organizationally and also in terms of resources. But once you are doing that, it makes it easier to engage the Ministry of Health and Child Welfare, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And be able to talk and say, what can you offer? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about some of the skills being repatriated back to Zimbabwe or not? What exactly are you saying you can offer to the Ministry of Health? Are you saying you can act as consultants? You know, so only you can tell. I'm not a health person. But only you can tell. But I think the biggest challenge that I find with you Zimbabweans here is basically to be able to get organized. Mm -hmm. I, I think you are uh, too much of individuals mm -hmm. or maybe uh, small little groups. But sometimes don't start it too big. Mm -hmm. It's just enough, for instance, for just psychiatrists to organize themselves as psychiatrists and say, what can we do? Mm -hmm. You know, in Zimbabwe, our psychiatric uh, services just collapsed. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, in, in, under the means of justice, I, I lead the means of justice, as you know. Under the means of justice, if someone with mentally ill commits a crime, could be murder, what if you? Uh, the first thing is, uh, first, if it's mental ill, it's not a crime. Mm. You understand? Yeah. But to prove that it's mental ill, you need a psychiatrist. Mm. Isn't it? Mm. Now, to find those psychiatrists 
to certify a patient or an accused person that given what I studied, this person is called schizophrenic. We don't have those nurses. Time, you know, those doctors. Time to Chikara. I think I was on Bono, Mindagas, on Kuntuaba. You know, in Chikara, the whole country. There were probably two psychiatric doctors. So that, that gives you an idea of the gap that exists. So I can't see any reason, for instance, either, you know, let's take the psychiatrists, doctors. Uh, they should come home if they want will. Uh, if they don't come home, they could wake up, wake out, for instance, periods when they can come to lecture to train other psychiatrists. Yeah. You understand? Mm. They could come just for one month to the University of Zimbabwe mm. or Nas University. They do lecturing and paid for. Why won't one of them? And it mm. hey, that is the sort of thing contribution they can make. Mm. So the scope of contribution you can make is enormous. But you need to be organized. And I think to start with it would be very good to talk, get organized, starting with this on a smaller scale. Yeah. Yes. People who are in the, the diaspora in Africa, they have already started doing that. I know quite a number who have engaged the universities. They, you know, as lecturers, they have their various projects. Let's say a lecturer in, in um, Namibia mm -hmm. is in a project, you know, with maybe. Canada, you know, they build in that project uh, a, a situation whereby that lecturer and others will come a study to, a stud, yeah, they'll come like to study the study University visits. of Zimbabwe yeah, yeah. and assist and teach and also supervise the students from their own countries. Just like you can also offer the Ministry of Health to say they can, you can help them with this kind of analysis that is required, you know, uh, and you make an analysis, you give back to the minister. But minister, uh, what what has been problematic with uh, most of the people in the diaspora, I should say, is to expect that the government is going to stand on the door and say, uh, we have this problem, that problem, that problem. We need you A, we need you B and C to come and assist us on one, two, three. You need to offer yourselves mm. to say, I am available, or we My are expertise is. My expertise is. And this is what I can offer. Mm. And most of the time, if we put the money issues ahead, uh, we, we normally don't get anywhere. You find that if you, are, if you can be the one to mobilize the resources, to mobilize the projects, to mobilize the linkages, then I mean, automatically, that is very welcome. I understand what could be the expectations of the diasporans, mm -hmm. but all the same, it's, uh, I'm talking this from experience. Mm -hmm. I feel, uh, it's not like saying, we are expecting the government to come and knock on the door and say, mm -hmm. we are just we need this point. But I think the government also has the responsibility to create the incentives, mm -hmm. realizing that their children who have gone out there, they have these skills that they mm -hmm. are required. We didn't know that there are no psychiatrists in Zimbabwe mm -hmm. until years mm -hmm. ago. But now, if the if the government in its various disciplines, various ministries, would actually put an incentive, they say, I mean, uh, to the Zimbabweans all over the world, they may not, you may actually get responses not in the diaspora, but even in Zimbabwe in the private sector. Can I add to that? Some of them may not be incentives because it's. You know, I've worked with governments before, and I know it's difficult for us mm. to say, oh, the government can just give an, an incentive. No, when I say incentive, it's not something of a benefit. But no, no, okay. Mm. What I'm saying is, it, what what I think is very fair, because a lot of um, governments, especially, in, I know Nigeria, for instance, they recognize that when someone's bringing those skills, they'll make it easy for them to engage. Mm. Because as things stand right now, if you go back to Zimbabwe, and you're just going to have to now go into the job market. So it makes it very unattractive for someone who's here to want to go back. So a lot of them may not be necessarily incentives of saying, well, we're going to pay cash like the British government did with, um, with nurses and carers here. But at least incentives where, um, you know, it's easier for them to get into perhaps more senior positions. Maybe if they're bringing certain skill set. Um, let me correct, let me correct my words. In the health sector. In the health sector. 
A, a lot of that is happening. A lot of that is happening. Uh, we do have challenge on the budget to the extent that we have been training nurses and we are not able to place them. Right. And they have already started, I think, uh, if I recall, there is now some scheme to try to place them in our neighboring countries. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. where we are negotiating with Namibia, with Botswana, maybe any country that would want the services of our nurses. Because we don't want to stop. Because currently it's not like we are overstaffed. But there are budgetary, budgetary constraints. And because of that, we are unable to absorb what we are producing. Because what I would want you to see, for, for instance, uh, right in the, the, from the outset, is a database of who is in the diaspora, mm -hmm. including qualifications, mm -hmm. and where they are, email, and so on. If we can create that database, mm -hmm. that is already going a wrong way. For instance, uh, people don't know that uh, there are international jobs in the UN system because we fight for a quota. Say Zimbabwe must have some quota in international jobs, WTO, WHO, uh, WIPO. All these organizations, we are a member and we have been fighting in Geneva to say all these jobs we want a, a quota reserved for Africans because the preponderance is that is everybody else except Africans. Now, it's well and good to say to fight for a quota. If you are granted, it's another thing to say when a vacancy occurs, whom do we put? It would be very good if we had a database which allows us basically to, to them through the network. Please apply for this job. It's very important. 